Time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of paying for health care. This week, Angelina Jolie made headlines with an op-ed piece about her elective surgery to remove her ovaries and stave off cancer, a choice she made to take control of her health, raising questions about an old debate here. Within hours of getting a scary call from her doctor, Angelina saw a specialist, got tests, and had the surgery within days. She's been celebrated. That's what it's all about, making the right decision for you. But it wasn't long before some pointed out taking charge of one's health like that isn't open to everyone. In the U.S., health plans aren't created equal. And in Canada, people wait. I've waited, 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 and waited. It's probably the worst feeling you can imagine. This is a type of suffering that could be resolved. This BC teen waited two and a half years for spine surgery. He finally went to the U.S. to get it, but by then, it was too late. I used to walk. I used to can walk. Now I can't walk anymore. He's one of the plaintiffs in a BC court challenge from this prominent doctor who runs a private clinic. He wants the government to allow access to more private health care. Patients in Canada are suffering and dying on wait lists. But what we're asking for is our day in court. But is more private medicine a solution for all? Or just the gateway to great care for some? Just the leg, Angie, just the leg. Joining us now, two regulars. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto, and Dr. Danielle Martin from our National Checkup Panel, also known for her defense of the Canadian health care system before the U.S. Senate. And from Washington tonight, Marnie Supkoff. She might look familiar as a former guest on our Sunday panel. Now, she heads a group funding a legal challenge to allow private health insurance in B.C. And in Ottawa, Armin Yelnizian, senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. So, John, an economist, a lawyer and a doctor, we're all set for a big debate, actually. It, should Canadians be able to go outside the system, Danielle, and, and, and buy more services uh, for themselves? Well, we started out talking about the Angelina Jolie case, which is actually a really good example. So, you know, a... Uh, to have surgery, a mastectomy, or your ovaries removed in Canada because you are the carrier of a gene that might uh, lead you to have cancer in the future is covered uh, in Canada. And, and in fact, in my own organization, we have a big familial cancer program that includes the person who co-discovered that gene. And so, um, you know, absolutely, uh, women need to be able to take control of their own health. Uh, I think what we sometimes forget is that for the vast majority of Canadians, they wouldn't get or ever see more control in a system where wealthy people were able to jump the queue. Uh, the reality is that that is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of health care interventions that someone like that had. Most Americans can't afford that. Most Canadians can't afford that. What we should be doing is looking for solutions within the framework of a system that actually gives people access to their care based on their need rather than their ability to pay. Marty, I think you look at this a little differently. Yeah, I think I might even say a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think the ability to actually take charge of your health and care for your own body is incredibly important. In fact, I would argue, and, and we are arguing uh, in court, that it's a charter-protected right. But when you look at, I mean, yes, it's true. You could say that, okay, it would be covered to have your ovaries removed, as Angelina di did. Um, but that's, that's fairly meaningless when you're also looking at a system where even for something as serious as spinal surgery, which you saw in the intro with, with Waleed, uh, who waited more than two and a half years. So yes, it was covered, but by the time he waited more than two and a half years, he's ended up paralyzed. Um, another one of the plaintiffs uh, was, uh, was a mom, and, and she, she needed to have a diagnostic test, um, which again, she waited, and, and it turned out she had cancer, which spread while she was waiting. When she finally got the test in a private system, she realized she was at stage four. So um, yeah, it's great that we have coverage, and this, this suit is not doing anything. We're not saying that everyone shouldn't be covered. In fact, we absolutely stand behind that that every Canadian should and will continue to be covered. The question is whether people should have the choice. If they're stuck on a wait list and do want to go outside the government system, should the government step in and say, no, you have no right to do that and we're actually going to legally prevent it? And I think the answer is no. Armin, I'll come to you in just a moment. Daniel, you're trying to get in here. Well, just, you know, uh, without getting into the details, the specifics of these cases, you know, there are, uh, there are special circumstances, of course, and we've also seen in the private system, we had a case not long ago in Toronto in a private 
private clinic where a woman died having liposuction surgery because nobody hooked up her oxygen to the to the tank. So, you know, there are unfortunate stories in every single healthcare system, two-tier systems, one-tier systems, et cetera. The question is, how do you construct a system that serves the vast majority of people as, as best it can the vast majority of the time? Army? And that's what we need to focus on. Armin, I'll bring you in here. What do, what do you think? Should the system be opened up to let the wealthy pay or the people who want to invest in, uh, in, in surgeries like Marnie has mentioned? Well, what happens when you let people pay to get to the front of the queue, what you, you, what you get is two different sets of triage. So one set of triage is based on um, need and the other set of triage is based on dollars. So you're getting people that have actually less urgent need getting care more quickly than people that actually have urgent need. And so if you like basically close down one lane of the highway to let people that can pay move a little bit faster, you've moved everybody else into one fewer lane and everybody's moving slower. So yeah, you've spe speeded up the system for some people, but you've actually slowed it down for the vast majority. Come back and to you I in a moment, Marnie, but John, I'll <laughs> let you in here. Sure. Well, I mean, Armin has used a perfect model, and you can look at any other rationing system, be it go to the front of the line at Pearson Airport because you have the right credit card, or go to the front of the line at Disney World. I mean, you still have the same flow of people and the same need. I don't tend to fetishize the system the way a lot of people do, though, because I think uh, with innovation and some public-private mix, which exists in every country in the world except for Canada and Cuba, then you actually can speed things up and people can get better care. Um, but I would always say you've got to have a baseline of quality, and this is the quality quality and rapidity of treatment options that are available to everybody, be you homeless or a millionaire, and if somebody else wants to top that up, then knock yourself out. So how would it actually improve it for the rest of us then, Marnie? I guess, you know, the, the argument is made that it would take some, if the wealthy were allowed to pay for some of their services, it would ease up pressure. Is that, is that what you're arguing? Well, that's definitely one point. Um, certainly, when you take someone out of the queue, that removes pressure on the public system. So I've always found the road analogy a little bizarre because what you're really doing is adding an extra lane, and that means that people who are using the resulting lanes are going to be actually moving more quickly. We actually have a surfeit of doctors right now who don't have operating time. Uh, so, so if the suggestion is somehow that there would just be doctors who would be plucked from the public system to move to the private, uh, I think that's pretty unrealistic. We're certainly seeing in BC that there are they're just the BC government itself has admitted there are so many orthopedic surgeons who just are not working at capacity who would like to stay in public and private system. But I think also the other important thing is that I think it's a bit of a myth to sort of suggest that if you did have an option for private care, that it would only be the super rich. I'm not suggesting that everyone, every Canadian, would be making use of this system. But I think we shouldn't forget that we that many people currently have workplace insurance that covers things like vision care and dental. Um, that's not everybody, but it's a lot of Canadians. And and I think there's obviously a very easy way for, for private insurance to be worked into that system. So um, this idea that it would only be the Angelina Jolie's is not realistic. What about that idea, though, Danielle, that if you have people who are paying for, for their own services, would that not make more people available to serve the rest of us? So, in fact, when the Canadian Medical Association looked internationally at all the countries in the world that have different mixes of public and private, what they found is that there's no evidence at all to support this claim claim that somehow by allowing a few people to pay for their own care, you reduce wait times for everybody else. Quite the opposite in the, in the UK, in New Zealand, uh, in Australia. We've seen examples where actually allowing that kind of uh, private care, what, what ends up happening actually is physicians reduce their time in the public system. And so um, it's not a one-to-one. -one. The other thing I think it's important to remember is that the healthcare system isn't just staffed by orthopedic surgeons, right? It takes nurses, technologists, administrators, uh, technicians of all kinds to staff a healthcare system. And we don't have a surf, we don't have an ocean liner full of healthcare workers sitting off the coast of Newfoundland ready to come into Canada and take over running the parallel private tier. As soon as you see people moving into the more lucrative private practices, I have a colleague uh, who was saying that he works in New Zealand where they, some uh, physicians refer to their public practices as farming tilling the soil for your, for your private patients, um, you, you end up in a situation, first of all, of deep conflict of interest, but also in a situation where inevitably you reduce access for everybody else. So, I mean, John was talking about this fetishization that we have this sort of ideal notion of, of universal health care as a standard in this country. You work for an organization that has fought for universal health care. Is the allegiance to it starting to shift? I mean, are things changing a little bit? 
Not for us, because if you just look at the evidence that's out there, actually there's a, a wait times alliance. And we had, in 2004, a 10-year strategy to reduce wait times in five areas. And in four of them, wait times have dropped dramatically in the last 10 years. Well, they actually dropped, and then they kind of evened off. Um, they uh, started to drop again last year. So there's been a couple of years of kind of stagnation. If you understand that if you're actually doing the things you know how to do, the, all the stuff that John was talking about, where you're using the techniques you know to actually smooth out wait lines, doing queue management and stuff like that, and actually adding capacity, because the public se sector is also adding capacity to the system, you can actually get more volume. So that's going to slow down the reduction too. Um, but you know what's really ironic is the only jurisdiction that had an increase in wait times last year is BC. What is BC? It is the cutting edge of the privatization fight, the case that Marnie's talking about. Dr. Day's clinic is one of many clinics that Dr. Day has opened up to actually add capacity to the system. And where do waiting, line, uh, waiting lines go up? In BC. Marnie? What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I think I think that's the suggestion that waiting, line, that waiting times have gone up in BC because of Dr. Day's clinic strikes me as incredibly ridiculous. If you look at the other two tier countries in the rest of the world, which as John pointed out, is much of the rest to the world. Uh, they have shorter ER wait times than we do and the U.S. They have shorter wait times in general than we do. The U.S. and the Canada are basically competing for the bottom um, when, it, when, when you look at how OECD countries are doing. Uh, and this is not an accident and it's not a coincidence. It's because they are working with the both tiers. Mar Mar where is the political support at this point, do you think, John? I mean, is, mm -hmm. is, there, is there more openness to the big change that Marnie is uh, Yeah, I, is I think for? most Canadians perhaps are a bit like Armin. I think Canadians <laughs> are ready to talk about this, and the problem is this perception that if we start talking about it, the whole system's going to fall apart or we're under assault. Uh, that, that's, that's the fear. So I think I, it's not going to feature, I don't believe, in the upcoming election. But if Conservatives were re-elected, I think they might start taking a look at it. I think the NDP would certainly backstop the system as we have it. But you know what? One of the problems is, if you took, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, Marnie, but... Um, the people who are attacking the system insist that it's broken, and it's not actually broken. I mean, people talk about waiting times in emergency rooms. There are people with the sniffles at the emergency room. So if we start attacking the system and we look at the actual wait times, as Armin has uh, specified for things like hip and knee replacement, the system's not broken. It just needs to be better. We it's are really almost out of time. I'm going to give one last word to Danielle and then to Marnie. Danielle? So, of course, the system needs to be better, absolutely. It just needs to be better for everyone. And I think the more we waste our time... Uh, in this public-private debate, that's less energy for all of us working in the system, providers in the system wanting to give the best possible care for patients and to all Canadian citizens. That's energy we could be using to actually innovate within Medicare where there's lots of work that Last needs to be point, done. Last quick point, Marnie. Yeah, I agree that, the, that obsessing about public-private is a waste of time, and that's why I think it's time for the government to get out of the way and say, look, you as a patient, it's your body, it's your health, you choose. We're going to keep making sure. We're going to do everything we can to give you timely access to great care. Meanwhile, you make whatever decision is right for you, and that's all that we're asking for. Well, Angelina got us talking this week, but it's not going to end for a few months, I don't think. Thank you very much for being with us, all of you tonight. Thank, Thank you. you.